Hello, church family. It's such a great honor and a privilege to be in front of you. And as I think of the songs that we were singing, as I look at um, the message that we're going to look at today together, I just can't help but smile as I look across this uh, worship center and I just see so many different people with so many different pasts, with, from so many different places, with so many different cultures and so many different subcultures. So I just have a smile and I rejoice and I thank you all for being here. So as we open up God's word, I invite you to open up to Ephesians chapter four, verses one through seven. Let us read together. Ephesians chapter four, verse one. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Before we start, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for you loving us before we ever knew what love was. Thank you for sending the perfect gift of your Son to save us from our sin debt. Father God, as we look at your word and as I explain it, Father God, I pray that you allow me to get out of the way and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Father God, I pray that you give me and everyone in here an extra measure of grace as we unpack this passage. And it's through your son we pray, amen. So Ephesians is a book that is written, well, it's a letter written by Paul, an apostle of Jesus, and he writes this letter to Christians that live in a city of Ephesus. Now, similar to Philippians, like we are studying, Paul also wrote this letter from a prison in Rome after first going there as a missionary. We see that the apostle Paul wrote many letters and sent many letters out to all over the dispersed church and the New Testament era. And this is kind of similar to how the letter to Philippians was written. I thought that was neat. But we're picking up in chapter four. We have to ask the question, what happened in the first three chapters? We see that in chapters one through three, Paul is encouraging fellow believers by reminding them of the gospel. And we look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, a passage that is so rich and so clear in the gospel. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result for, of works so that no one may boast. This is a passage that's so rich that we see in the first three chapters of Ephesians. But the main cha challenge that we see Paul challenges the church of Ephesus and challenges us today is Christians are to not focus on our earthly citizenship, but to be citizens of heaven. We see that right at the end of chapter 3, Paul is encouraging the church, do not forget that we are citizens of heaven. Now, as 2020 comes along, I know this is the first Sunday and we have a whole year ahead of us, but there's certain things that a lot of people think about when they think of 2020. Now, some people are thinking about bad puns about vision that are going to be coming out, some things, um, but there's a lot of events. And one event that I want to bring uh, to light here is the Olympics. The Olympics is happening in Tokyo uh, this year. And there's one event, the main opening ceremony of this event, that I want us to look at. Now, as you see all these pictures, you see that there are whole nations that come. There's actually 206 nations that participate in the Olympics, over 11,000 athletes, and in over 33 events. So this is something that takes place and kind of the world goes on pauses as they watch the Olympics. But what I want you to look at is the opening ceremony. In the opening ceremony, the announcer announces nation after nation as they enter. And you see, they all are alike. They all are walking unified together. And they're all distinct from other nations. The unity of these nations as they enter is distinct. Now, 
thinking of what Paul said, that we're also supposed to remember our citizenship that's in heaven, I invite you to look back at the passage and look at the first point. The unified manner in which we are called to walk, verses one through three. We see that the calling of being a Christian is something that we are not to take lightly. The calling to be a Christian is something that we are not to take lightly. It is a weighty calling. It is not something that you just wake up one morning and you choose to do. It is not something that all of a sudden, you know what, I'm going to be a Christian today. No, it is a calling that once our hearts have been regenerated to hear the gospel, once we understand that our sins cannot be paid for by our actions, it is a calling that we are called to do, and it's a weighty calling. We see that in verse 1 as we look at the you in verse 1. Now, if you look at the original language, that you is not singular, like we like to think about, but it is a plural you. It's like for some of us that have a country accent, it's like saying y'all. Or some of us that are more proper, we say you all. That's the equivalent to the you that is there. And we see that we're being called in verse 1. So it's the equivalent of saying you are urged to be in unity. You are called to be in unity. So then we see the answer of we are called, but we ask, have to ask the question of how are we called then? Well, praise the Lord, the answer is in verse 2. We are to love one another with humility and gentleness. Paul's calling us because we're called as part of the church, but we're called to walk in a manner of humility and gentleness and patience and bearing one another in love. We see that as Christians, we are called from our eternal creator God to be holy for he is holy. We see that as clear in the Bible as we look at Leviticus 11, verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. God's call for us to be holy is very clear, and it says it very clearly in Scripture. We then lastly look at how we're called as Christians. We are called to act in a manner that is deemed worthy, but not worldly. Often you hear Pastor Andrew say that we're not supposed to be odd for God, but we are supposed to be counterculture. We are called to be counterculture. We're called to be in this world, but not of it. We're also called to be distinct from the world. We're called to not be clumped up with everyone in the world. No matter where you are in your daily life, there should be a distinction between you that is a Christian, you that are a follower of Christ, and people that are not. Then in verse 3, we see the unity we have is not by our own work, but through the work of the Spirit. The change that happens in our heart, the change that the gospel has on our personal life is not based off of a 10-step plan to make your life better or follow these steps and you are becoming a better person. No, it is through the Spirit working in our hearts and in our lives, making us more and more like Christ. Now, this was important for Paul to make sure of in, verse, in chapters 1 through 3 and also in the first three verses because the city of Ephesus was actually in modern-day Turkey. It was the one major city that people would travel to, and it was a port city that people would go to before they went to Asia, before they went into all the different cultures. So Ephesus was a big melting pot of Greco-Roman culture, but also with Asian culture as they came in. And the main message that we must see in verses 1 through 3 that Paul is making so clear to us is there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. There is one gospel for Jew and Gentile. There is one plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile. There's not the salvation for the Jews this way, but the Gentiles will be sal uh, saved through this way. No. There's one gospel, one plan of salvation for Jew, for Gentile, for all nations of this world. There's one plan for salvation. Next, we see the foundation of our unity. We see that our unity must be founded in something. We must be united 
with something and by something. We look at the foundation of that, verses four through six. But verse four, the church is referred to as one body. A group of sinners united through the gift of grace despite our differences. We look around in this room and we see people from all different places, all different walks for life, and we're here and we're united. Why? Because the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because Christ died for our sins. Because we have faith in Christ. A lot of us, we would never interact with one another outside of the church, outside of being fellow brothers and sisters. But we see that it draws us from all different walks of life to be unified behind one cause. And we also see that there's not a church here. We also see there's not an American church. There's not a South American church. There's not a European church. No, there is one church unified by the gospel, unified by the work that Christ has done, unified by what God's plan from the beginning was. We also see that the unity that we have through the Holy Spirit is something we must keep eagerly. We see it's not something that we're supposed to kind of, well, if it happens, it happens. No, it, this is something that we're supposed to fight for. This is something that we're supposed to long for. This is something that we must keep. So we see that there's also one spirit that dwells in us. The regeneration of our hearts is not based on our outward appearance. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter where we come from. All of our hearts from conception is a sinful fallen heart is a heart that is longing for something. It's like a piece of a puzzle that is missing something. It's a heart that needs to be transplanted. All of us in this room have a sinful, fallen heart that does not want to do the things that we're called to do in verse 2, to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, and to love one another. We're not called to do that, but the one spirit that dwells in us, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us regenerates our heart despite any outward appearance, despite all of our differences. We see that as sinners, we need one spirit that dwells, I'm sorry, as sinners in need of one savior, we all have one hope, a hope to, in someone to justify our sins. We are up a creek without a paddle. We are lost. There's nothing that our good works or actions would do that would ever come close to paying our sin debt. Because we are fallen, because we have these sinful hearts, our hearts and our actions and our deeds, like I was saying, are not humble, are not gentle, are not patient. We naturally do not want to do things that are good. We naturally want to do things that are evil. But we have one Savior, and our hope is in that Savior. And he justified our sins, past, present, and future. He was the plan from the beginning. As you look in Genesis, we see we made man in our image. Father, Son, and Spirit was there. We see that he was in the beginning. Then we see that he came and humbled himself. And as we celebrate during Christmas time, came as in the virgin birth as a child and took on human form. We see that he fulfilled the laws, the old Jewish laws and fulfilled the Old Testament covenant. We see that he lived the perfect life that we could never even dream of living and died the death that we deserved. The debt that our sin had needed to be paid for with the shed of blood. And it was shed for not by our blood, but by Christ's blood. So look at Romans 6, verse 4. It's laid out so clearly to us. For Christians, we are buried, therefore with him, by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we too may walk in the newness of life. Now, we're not saying that we put our faith in Christ and now we go off and we live exactly the same way we did before we were Christians. No. But now that we were dead in our sins the way that we are, and we died the way that Christ did, and now that we are raised up again the same way Christ was, that we now walk in the newness of life. Baptism is something that happens after the Holy Spirit regenerates your heart to hear the gospel. You truly hear the gospel. Now, it's not just having the knowledge of the gospel and being able to articulate it, but your heart, your longs to hear the gospel, and it truly hears the gospel and you truly put your faith alone in Christ alone, then what happens? The Bible is clear. Then we are to be baptized. Baptism is just an outward expression of an inward decision. Baptism is just us as a church affirming this person putting their faith in Christ alone and becoming a Christian. Now, we have to ask the question then, If someone is affirming, and us as a church is affirming someone's salvation, and we see that the Bible says we are baptized in Christ. Now, we don't see people just constantly be re-baptized to reaffirm that they're with Christ. No, that, that would be silly. If we see someone up there four or five times every month being baptized, saying, I just want to constantly reaffirm to the church that I'm a Christian, we would look at that and ask, Why? No, that's not what the Bible says to do. But with this table here in front of us, us members of Christ's church, members of the one body, we come together and at this table and we remember the death and resurrection. We remember the body that was broken and the blood that was spilt for our sins as we take the bread and we take the cup. As our teeth crunch the bread, It is our sins crushing Christ's body on the cross. So as we come before this and we see that Christ is calling us to be baptized and also to be unified at the Lord's table. Verse 6, the church is unified by one God who is the creator, sustainer, and provider of all things. We are unified through Christ in God. And he creates and sustains all things. So as one church, we are called then to be ready as a bride waiting for her groom. We are called as a bride waiting for her groom. It's such a clear image that we see throughout the Bible. And as we look at Revelation 19, verse 6 through 8, I want you to see what Scripture says. The illustration that Scripture gives of how the church is supposed to be waiting for Christ to return. Revelation 19, 6 through 8. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out hallelujah for the Lord our God the almighty reigns let us rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen bright and pure now do not miss this last point For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We see that us walking in the way that we are called, in the manner in which we are called, the humility, the patience, the gentleness, being united in love under one gospel is the righteous deeds of the saints, of the saints, of us. And that is how we're called to be unified. That is how we're called to prepare ourselves as Christ's church, as the bride waiting for her groom. It is by the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, there has been hundreds of weddings in this building. Hundreds. Now, I want you to picture a wedding going on right now. You all surprised. We're here for a wedding. And I want you to notice that there is a groom 
dressed in a nice tuxedo, and he has tons of groomsmen dressed in nice tuxedos as well. And they're sitting there, they're waiting, they have their corsages, they have their matching color schemes, they're ready to go. Then you see a bunch of bridesmaids standing here, all in their nice color scheme dresses with their hair and makeup done. You see all of you here are nice in dressed attire, ready for the ceremony. And when the song is played for the bride to walk down the aisle, we stand and look towards the door and we see a young lady walk in with sweatpants, and a t-shirt, and some flip-flops. We, we all think that is, that's funny. We all wonder, why is that like that? Why is everyone else dressed for the occasion, but the bride is not? This is the, the bride's day where she gets all dressed up, where we see a man and a woman coming before God and entering into a covenant with one another. But we look at the bride, and the bride is almost like she's not ready. She's not in her wedding dress. She's not prepared. We must long not to be the bride that is waiting and not prepared for her groom. We must stand ready. We must be clothing ourselves constantly in the fine linens, in our righteous deeds of the saints, unified under one gospel. We cannot be ready. We must long to be ready. Verse 7, the gift of Christ in his church. There's a gift that Christ has given us. Verse 7 says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. A gift was given to us. Now, as all our first students go back to school, you all will see everyone with their new gift that they got for Christmas, and they're there showing it off, and they're there, oh, look what I got for Christmas, or as some of you go back to work, you go and you say, oh, look, this is what someone has gifted me, but we must remember that gifts must be received. Gifts cannot just be left. Gifts cannot be left under the tree. But we must see that, first, we are all given different gifts that pertain to the ministry we are called to serve in. We are all given different types of gifts. Some of us are called to work with the children in the nursery. Some of us look at kids and go, ah, and are scared of kids. And, you know, there's other ways that you could serve. A greeting. You can sit there. You can help stuff bulletins. Some of us are called to teach Sunday school. Some of us are called to go overseas and proclaim the gospel. Some of us are called to go to school and get a biblical education and prepare for a life of ministry where you will shepherd the flock, you will take care of the saints and preach God's word. We are all called and given different gifts. But we must look at our different gifts and not say, this is my gift for me or this is my gift for what the area I served in, remember, the church is one body. Serving as different parts of the body, working in sync with one another. We must work together. That is the only way that we will be unified together as one body in one church. By putting aside our differences or where we may, come, may have come from and say we are united by the gift of Christ and his grace, that is what unites us and that is where we're going to take our gifts and use them where we are able to come together as one body and we're able to be a bride prepared ready for her groom. But we see that the biggest gift is not the area that we're called to serve or the gift that we are given. Our best gift is not because I work with youth. Our best gift is not because you work with the nursery. Our best gift is not because you lead senior adult ministry. Our greatest gift is Christ giving his life. Through Christ giving his life, we are given the grace that we do not deserve. That is the gift that supersedes all other gifts. That is the gift that, as we look at, we must remember the most. 
That is the gift that unites us together. And the gift that Christ has given us, Christ's gift of grace has given us all the grace we could ever need. When Christ died on the cross, he didn't die for all the sin up to that point. We don't see Christ coming back to die again on the cross. We see that when Christ died on the cross, he died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Now, Romans speaks very clear when it says, oh, since Christ died for my sins, uh, does that mean I could just continue and go on and keep on sinning? By no means, no. Because our faith is in Christ alone, our hearts are changed. Our ways of this world is no longer our ways, but it is ways that honor God. So when Christ died and gave us all the grace for our sins, past, present, and future, that means we are not to keep on sinning. We will stumble. We will fall. Yes. But we are to fight eagerly to be unified by the gospel. We should fight eagerly to honor Christ with our thought, actions, and our deeds. But gifts must be received. If you have not put your faith alone in Christ alone and you do not know that your sins, past, present, and future, have been reconciled or paid for, I ask you to ask the question, have you received the gift of Christ? Have you said, Lord, I cannot do this. None of my actions and deeds are honoring and glorifying to you. It is not through my actions that I could be saved, but it is through your work, your finished work on the cross that saves me. You must receive the gift of God's grace through his son. So as we look at this passage, as we look at Paul's call for us to be unified, as we look at Paul's call for us to be unified with the gospel, I have three points of application. Three ways that we can apply this to our lives, not as a 2020 resolution or not as something that we need to keep for the next few months or for the next year, but as something that as we continue with our walk with Christ until we see him face to face, we must fight eagerly to keep. Number one, we must remember the gift of grace that is given to Christians. And remember, the knowledge of the gospel is not enough. You must receive the gift of the gospel in order for the gospel to apply to you. You must confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must have the personal relationship with God through Christ in order for this grace to be applied to you. Secondly, as Christians, we must fight for our unity and fight against division. We must not tolerate the schemes of the devil. Throughout this year, throughout the rest of our lives, the world will constantly bring up things that will try to divide the church, that will try to divide us on issues, try to divide us on everything. But we must not let the schemes of the devil divide us, take apart our unity. We must not allow that. We must fight for our unity because it is unified on the gospel. And if you truly believe in the gospel, then you truly believe that it is the only way that we are saved. Then it is the only way that our sins could ever be forgiven. It is the only way that our relationship could be made right with God, the eternal creator of the world. We must fight eagerly for this. Now, Robin and I are getting married in 55 days, in case anyone's counting. But um, 
we, we had a, a great time of just being able to hear from a lot of other couples that have been married for a lot longer than we have, and we've had a lot of advice. Some of the advice, advice is, uh, you know, but a lot of the advice has been great advice, and we're so thankful that this church has come around us during this amazing um, time in our lives. But as we look at Christ being the groom and us being the bride of Christ, Robin and I have received a piece of a marriage advice that applies to our lives, but it also applies to us as the church. Someone gave us, a couple gave us the advice of, Satan hates unity. You must fight every ounce of your effort to keep your marriage together. Because the world will tell you everything else. The world will tell you, oh, you don't like them, it's okay, get a divorce. The world will tell you, oh, it's okay, you, you, you just lost your love for them. No. The same way that piece of advice applies for Robin and I as we prepare to get married, that applies to us as the bride. We must love one another, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter how hard it may be. We must be patient with one another. We must be gentle with one another. No matter what the circumstance is, the world and Satan hates unity. He hates the way that marriage is proclaimed and given in the marriage of this world between a man and a woman. He hates that. He does everything to try to distort that. And in our own marriages in this world and also in our marriage as us as the bride to Christ, we must fight every ounce of effort we have to stay unified as a bride into Christ. So in closing, our last point. We must stay unified as one church, as one body, as one bride, centered on the gospel, for the stakes are eternal. The stakes of our unity goes far beyond the, what is inside these walls. The stakes of our unity goes far beyond this world far beyond this time. It helps us with our testimonies to unbelievers. It helps us with our testimony as we share the gospel. So as testing and trials come this year and as for the rest of our lives as we walk as Christians, I urge you to stay together as one body, as one church, and as one bride centered around the gospel for the stakes are eternal. Let us go before the Lord and pray.